So as Bill said, I'm with the University of Minnesota. I've been there for 20 years dealing with manure issues. Um, either air quality or water quality or manure storages or you name it. I've been doing a lot of different things. Uh, the past couple of years, my uh, one of my big projects that I worked on is this issue of foaming in manure pits. Now when I say foaming, you know what I'm talking about in manure pits. How many have foam or experienced foam in their pits? At some point now or in the past, how many are planning to have foam in their pits in the future, very near future? Yeah. I do think it's just a matter of time in some of these situations and, and from the, from the uh, title of the talk, what's the title of the talk? Um, I forgot, what was it? Like, what have we learned? With a question mark at the end, and so I'm always kind of concerned about what have we learned. We've been looking at this issue for the last couple of years, and I'm hoping that we can share, I can share something today that we've learned uh, that might be useful. Just to tell you up front, we don't have the answer yet. So if you're looking for the answer, you have to talk to somebody else other than me, because there is no answer right now that I'm aware of. Um, for me, what, I've been at it for a long time, but the, the, the pinnacle of when things got started was in the fall of 2009 when I got called to a friend of mine, um, a commercial applicator, also a, a uh, contract grower, said, you know, my brother had this uh, barn explosion. We like to come out. We think it had something to do with manure. He was agitating at the time um, where this barn exploded. So I went out there, and this is the barn, looking inside the barn. Um, anyhow, the roof lifted off and then got set back down, not exactly in the same condition that it was before it got lifted off. And so um, uh, trusses were broken. Um, a big explosion occurred, and it occurred um, w during agitation. The barn was empty uh, between groups, and they were doing some agitation and pumping. Um, the, the farmer had been in the barn. Uh, just minutes before that had been out looking in the pump out where they were doing the agitation and actually when the barn exploded it, it shot him through the air about 30 feet landed on the ground. Everybody was fine um, but the result was that the barn was in full need of repair. They had to put a new roof on um, and so we started talking about well what was the issue? Why were you agitating? It was, it was um, uh, fall and he was trying to get rid of the foam that was in the in the pit and we talked about foam and I said well what do you mean foam so here's a picture of the, the fire sure oh, here it is. you can see coming out of the pump out there was actually flame shooting out of the pump out at that time um, fire trucks here's a picture of the rafters here's the agitation equipment right there in the barn so we looked in the other side of the barn this is a double wide 2400 head 1200 head barn 1,200 head on each side, that one side had exploded. And this was a picture in the other barn uh, side. And actually when I got there, the foam had, was, not through the f was not through the floor. It had grown through the floor in the two hours I was out there. Before, when I first went into the barn, on the side that hadn't exploded, there was no visual foam on the surface of the floor. And later, this two hours later, then we saw foam coming up through the floorboards. And he said, the foam had been on the other side of the barn too that had exploded and they were trying to agitate to reduce the foam, cut back on the foam so they have some more manure storage and so they were trying to move some of that manure out. So I thought that was really interesting trying to figure out if that foam had anything to do with fire and explosion. Look at the pump out, same thing, the, the foam was up to here. Now in this barn it wasn't because he had a foot left of headspace in there. The manure level was at like three feet, three to four feet of manure. This was three to four feet of foam in this barn and it came up really quickly for him. So this is my first experience like, oh that's really interesting that we have this much foam. I started going around looking at different foaming sites but that's what it looked like. A heavy crust with some foam breaking through and it was actually because it was a lot of manure in that pit they were having problems with it also coming up through the slab. Have you seen this foam? What kind of foam do you have? on your sites that you guys have had some foam at right now. Anyhow, so I think there's, when people call me on the phone now, I ask them about what kind of foam they have, how thick it is, and what the color of it is. Because I think it tells me, it tells me a little bit about what products have been working, and maybe what, when, when products work and when products don't. I think it has something to do with the consistency of that foam and maybe how long it's been a problem. So, in my tenure at the University of Minnesota, actually I don't have tenure, but I've been there a really long time. I just work for projects. So anyhow, I've had a call probably one a year for the last 20 years of somebody who has foaming. 
and I would go out and visit with them or talk to them on the phone. And they said, I have foam, and it's always I have foam in one pit, and I, it's, a, it's a four barn site or a two barn site, and nothing else in the other one. So I'd go visit with them, and we'd look around and we'd say, well, what's different about this barn or this room than the other ones? Typically, there's no really good answer. There was no good answer. They asked me what the solutions would be, and we'd mumble a few things that they wouldn't understand because I didn't really know what to tell them. There's no good evidence out there that anything would solve this foaming issue. Um, call them a couple years later, they said the foaming issue is all gone. We don't have it anymore, and often it was they changed um, the, the supplier of their pigs, and which meant they changed the diet or they got out of the pig business, whatever it was. They didn't necessarily have foaming when I would call them back. So in, since fall of 2009, though, the phone was ringing off the wall with people with foaming problems. Even Bill called me. And Bill's was a different situation. It was a nursery barn. So it wasn't, it's not strictly just finishing barn sites. It's happening in nursery barn sites. I haven't had any reports, I don't think, in gestation barns. But definitely in the nursery finishing barn sites, we've had this. Wean to finish or grow finish, it's been in all those barns. Um, same story, it's in some of the barns, not all the barns on the same site. Excuse me. Um, so then, tying a little bit with the barn explosion, I said, well, does that foam have anything to do with the, the barn that exploded? And that fall of 2009, there was two barns in Iowa that had had fires also. Turns out that one of them had had foam in the barn and the other one had not had foam in the barn. And since this time, like even this, even this, um, uh, this, this winter, I just talked to a farmer actually, and he had it. He had it this past winter. He had an explosion in the barn, um, but he didn't have foam, and he still ended up with a fire that that burned the inlets and singed the curtains and and uh, and melted the shutters on the fan. So, so it can happen. The fire and explosion can happen with or without the foam. Now I'm going to share a little bit about it. The foaming gives you, I think, a little higher potential for having. Um, fires and because of this. So methane methane is the flammable gas that, that causes these explosions and it's produced all the time in any anaerobic conditions you're generating biogas. So these people that are putting in anaerobic digesters generating biogas, producing electricity, that's a process that goes on all the time in the manure pits whether they're inside or outside you're generating biogas at some level and that biogas has methane in it. The methane concentration is about 60% methane, and when it comes up, there's the foam actually, and we're thinking it's a bacteria population, another separate bacterial population that creates some filaments, and it kind of traps the gases as it's leaving that manure storage. So the foam captures the methane. Like I said, the methane is in that 60 to 70% concentration in that foam. Now that concentration is too high to actually burn. All right, so that will not explode. You won't get any any explosion with methane at that 60 to 70 percent, which is in the biogas. However, when the bubbles are broken, the methane dilutes in the head space above in the barn space, right in the building envelope. And if you get it to that concentration between five and 20 percent, that's when it's explosive. And so we're mixing the methane that's trapped in the bubbles of that foam as those bubbles break you release a big slug of methane, it mixes with that air above in the barn, and that's when you get those explosive concentrations. Looks something like this, and this is another piece of information. When I was calling some of these guys that had foam in the past, I said, you know, do you have foam? No, I don't have foam anymore. I said, have you ever had a fire in your barn? Well, you know, actually I've had two fires in my barn. And how did that go? Well, he said, it, the barn was empty, and we were doing some welding in between groups. There was, no there was no foam in the barn. There was a clear liquid surface underneath. And he said some of the sparks from the welder dropped through. And I saw a blue flame going across the surface of that manure storage. Right? Anybody have that experience? Know of someone who has, right? This guy had, had it done a couple times. He said, it, and the second one was a little bigger than the first one, but he knew what was going on. And as soon as he saw that blue flame, he got out of the building as quickly as possible. He also ended up with some, um, you know, some damage from the burning, from the explosion. So I think it looks something like this. So it's a no foam barn. The brown, of course, being the manure in my representation here. 
And then the red was that methane at high concentration, that 60 to 7 percent concentration. And above that is when it starts diluting out. So all the time we have, there's no air movement down below in that pit. You're going to get a layer of methane that's about at that explosive concentration. Right? And this typically would happen with minimum ventilation conditions. You don't get a lot of mixing in that pit. And you're going to see this concentration. So a spark drops through the pit, and you're going to see that yellow um, flame off, right? Because that's at the right concentration. Now you have another barn that's got foam. So now this red layer is a lot higher. That 70% methane is in that red layer that's trapped in the foam. Now what happens when you release that foam, break the foam, you release all that methane, and it mixes with all the air above, and you get a much bigger explosion because there's a lot more methane that just mixed in with the barn. So it looks like this as the Foam breaks, causing a large release. Now that whole place is in that flammable range, and you end up with the large explosion from that. So we've had several explosions. Between us and Iowa and Illinois, there's a dozen or so barns that have exploded because of the, I think, the foaming issue. And there's a few more that have had these fires because, not just because of the foaming, but just because there's some hazards. The last guy I talked to it was just agitation of the manure that created an explosion in the barn. Once again, uh, the, it was between groups. They were getting some manure out because they were full. They were agitating with minimum ventilation, and they ended up exploding the barn. I said, was there foam? He said, there was no foam. I got seven barns. None of them have foam. That one didn't have foam either. Just so happened that there's release of those gases. Those gases are being produced like all the time in the manure. And if you have a full pit and you start agitating, you're going to release that methane, and it's going to cause concentrations that are in that explosive range. That don't make sense. Fits with what the reality is out there. So we have some research that's go ongoing right now, uh, funded by the um, University of Minnesota Rapid Response Funding, and uh, our goal was to determine causes of foaming and find solutions. And in this project, we did a bunch of site visits, we did some survey work, and we did some manure analysis, trying to figure out what exactly was going on with this foaming issue. I'm going to share some of that right now. We had two really good responses from grower groups, all right, and we're going to call it Z2. In the winter of 2010, we took um, 28 out of 80 producers participated in the survey. So we went to, um, it was an online survey, and we asked the, the integrators to say, hey, can you have your, your growers fill out this survey? And so we got fairly good participation, 28 out of 80 wasn't perfect. Um, so information on 83 rooms, seven of those had foam. So 25% of those barns that were surveyed reported some foaming issues. Um, and if you look at the numbers, actually eight of the 83 rooms had six to 18 inches of foam. So significant. It wasn't like a 1% have foam. There's, in some cases, and I've seen this since then, that some grower groups have up to 50% of their barns have foaming issues, which is a big deal. Other grower groups, which is kind of interesting to me in itself, they don't have issues with foam. They don't have any foam. They might have one, less than 1% foaming. And I think, in general, most of the diets and genetics are, are different a little bit, but not significantly different to say that there's this big, dramatic difference between 50% of barns foaming and like less than 1% foaming. So we asked a bunch of questions related to this. Our hypothesis was that something happened in the barns that foam. They had a feed spill, which added a bunch of organic material. They were feeding extra DDGs, and so the DDGs must be the cause of it. And so we had them report all this stuff. We asked, asked them also about fires and explosions. Um, and I'll talk about those correlations between those different things in just a second. The second um, group, N3, we had a 90% response rate. This was done at a, a grower meeting. We all came in and we said, we're not leaving the room until everybody fills out the survey. There's about six people who didn't leave the room that day, right? So in that same response rate, though, look at that, that we had 28%. The other one had about 25% foaming. This had about 28%. So I think a big percentage of their barns were foaming also, if you're talking about 25%. Um, but, but in this case, only three of the producers report, reported with six inches or more foam. Now, I think if I would have had the video back then when they were doing the survey and I could have said, does your foam look like this and you have this much foam, I think we would have had a better understanding of what foam means because a lot of people might call it foam when there's just an inch of bubbles on the top of your manure storage. In any case, um, in this one also no, no feed spills were reported. 
we had one fire in this group. So one fire, well that's, well it's only one fire, but if you think of the odds of this, 90 growers and you get fires, the insurance companies are actually thinking about this a little bit. So you know, we've got a lot of reports of fires, what should we be doing? Should we be charging different, or should we be requiring different things for these barns? We looked at kind of the geographic location and I would say just look at the colors, it's not really important, the percentage that we're foaming because we didn't have really good numbers from all these counties, but it was shown that there were some pockets that maybe there wasn't so much foam and there was pockets that there was a little bit more foam going on. But it was spread out over Iowa and Minnesota, southern uh, Minnesota and Iowa. Also there's been a lot of foaming reported in Illinois. There's a group in Illinois that's working on it as well as I on doing some research with this. but. Illinois has problems. Nebraska has no problems with foaming. They had one barn, I think, over the last year, and that was some barns that had leaked over from Iowa or something. Um, and so they had foam there. But in, in Nebraska, typically no foaming. Ohio, typically no foaming. Michigan's got foaming. So it's kind of a regional issue. It's kind of a northern issue. Um, geographically, it seems like there's pockets even in Minnesota. Some counties have foaming. Um, others, you know, when I did some talks last year, I went out to southwestern Minnesota and they, didn't, they looked at me like I didn't have a clue what, I mean, they didn't have a clue what foam was because they had never heard of it. They didn't know about barn exposure, they didn't know about foaming. Now we're getting calls from southwest Minnesota that they do have some foaming issues. So I think that the foaming is a spreading around the state a little bit. Um, so some of the questions we asked them were production type, were you wean to finish? What was your building age, uh, pumping frequency? We're saying, well, maybe they aren't pumping good enough. If they're pumping more often, was that going to be a um, reduce the solids? Maybe because it was a solids problem. It was really interesting. So one day I'm thinking about the solids. You know, it's, it must be because one barn foams and the other ones don't on the site. Did you do a good job pumping your manure? Did you get all the solids out? Because maybe the solids were feeding the bacteria, and so the bacteria were feeling really good and producing all the gas, producing the foam. Same day I talked to a guy who said, you know what, I have had a lot of problems lately with solids buildup. The same day I talked to another producer with the foaming issue and he said, this is a brand new barn. The first one was an old barn, been fighting solids for a long time. The second producer was a brand new barn. He started the barn um, and in, the, in the winter time, which meant he had to put about a foot and a half of water in the pit to keep it from freezing. And that barn also ended up with foam. So it wasn't an issue of solids buildup because the guy started with water in the barn. It was a brand new barn. It was the first year that he had had it. So it wasn't like it was a solids buildup problem. So anyhow, the survey kind of, kind of verifies those hunches that we had really weren't useful, that, that it wasn't a solids buildup um, that we could tell. Production type, lean to finish, nursery. We didn't really survey a lot of it. Capacity, you know, was it the drinker type? Did you have, you know, nipple waters in one and wet dry feeders in another one, you know, how did that play out? Nothing did. We thought about feed spills, we thought about pit additives. If you're using a pit additive, would that enhance your foaming or not enhance your foaming? From this survey, we really couldn't tell. And since then, I've talked to a lot of people. Some are using pit additives and don't have a problem. Some have tried pit additives and they still have a problem. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. <clears throat> So correlation between any of this stuff, the only thing we had was sometimes building age seemed to have some impact. But it wasn't big enough that building age really um, uh, made a difference that we could say, yeah, it's because it's an old building. So summary observations from this calls and surveys suggest that foaming is not predictable. Incidence of foaming is increasing in Minnesota and in Iowa. Uh, geographic factors result in higher or lower risk for foaming. So it seems like some areas just are not getting as much foaming as, as other areas. Um, often those sites where we said one barn was foaming, when we talk to them, I call them back, you know, six months later, you know what, those other barns are foaming right now. And so it's kind of interesting that over time some of this stuff um, continues to grow on the sites. Um, there is a little bit of reports now, Nebraska and Ohio since this past fall. Last fall they had nothing, last winter they had nothing, now they're getting a few reports of some foaming. I actually want to do some research and I want to partner with Ohio. And I called my friend out there um, this summer and I said, John, you know, have you got foaming issues? He didn't know what I was talking about. I said, well, that's really good, you don't know what I'm talking about because I want to compare the diet that you have there and your manure, take some manure tests from your barns 
comparing to our barns, and if you don't have foam, then I'm pretty sure that something is different between them. Well, then he called me about, about a month later, and he said, you know that stuff I told you about foam? He said, we're starting to get that. Do you want to send down information on foam? Because I want to get an extension publication put together on foam issues. Um, still no commonalities between barns, why one foam and, and one doesn't. There's also no sil silver bullet solutions. Um, nothing out there that we've come across so far has said, you know what, every time you do this, every time you use this additive, you'll solve your problem. Or every time you quit feeding this, you'll solve your problem. There's people not feeding DDGs. People that think, well, it's all a function of DDGs. There's people, research barn in Iowa, they aren't feeding DDGs because they were doing a DDG study and they have foam in the non-DDG barn. They have it in the DDG barn and the non-DDG barn. Um, so we didn't have any explosions until like January of this year. In the all the fall of last year, we didn't have any explosions reported in Minnesota. And I think it was because it was warm weather and we were getting the manure out of there and we could have full ventilation. Now we're getting some explosions because, well, we still have the same problem. There's some methane generated, the foam breaks, and typically it's a minimum ventilation condition. So when it's cold, you're going to have more of a problem with this explosion than when it's warm. So I kind of looking at this whole issue as a disease, that we might have some risk factors, maybe have risk factors for heart disease. That doesn't mean you're going to have a heart attack, right? It means that the risk is up that everybody that eats all these fatty foods might be at higher risk, but that doesn't mean we're all going to have the same problem, the same health issues. So I think it's a risk factor that we're increasing the risk of getting foam right now, and we had less of a risk a couple years ago for whatever reason that I think we have to understand it as a risk factor. Not all these barns are going to get foam. They could be doing the exact same thing, but they aren't all going to get foam. I think we have to say, going forward, we, have to need, we need to identify the risks, you know, what, and that's where our causes of foam, can we, can we figure it out a little bit closer on what might be causing the foam that we, aren't, we weren't getting in the past, and then make necessary adjustments to reduce these risks. Now, the risk of foaming, of foaming is one thing. The risk of having an issue like a flash fire, animal deaths, building damage, human deaths, I think we can control that a little bit. So the rest of my talk, I'm thinking about, well, if I have foam, how can I um, reduce the risk of having problems with this foam? So the working hypothesis, though, is that a microbial population imbalance, if there's a set of microbes that are really liking the situation right now and they overtake that manure storage, and it's kind of a random thing. I was talking to a microbiologist. He said, if you put the perfect conditions for this uh, specific type of microbes together. They like this pH, they like this temperature, they like this food. They said only about 30% of the time will you get those microbes to grow really well. So we still have that issue that we can have all the right conditions and it still is, there's things we don't know about getting those microbes to take off. So it's a filamentous bacteria, so it forms these um, mucus-like membrane that then traps the biogas as it's produced. So we may be getting just more biogas produced. We had the conditions before, but because something in the pit is producing more methane and more biogas, that those bubbles fill up quicker. So we don't know exactly sure, but there's two things, I think, or more going on in the system. There's no confirmation this yet. We have some research going forward that we're going to try and identify some of these bugs, bacteria, and then the conditions which make these bacteria grow good, and those, more importantly, those conditions that stop the bacteria from growing. This is a little bit of research that they did, that they're working on in Illinois also saying that we can identify some microbial differences in populations from foaming barns and non-foaming barns from the foam itself and the liquid below the foam. So there's different populations of bugs that we can tell and you're going to see this even in soil samples, you're going to see different populations of bugs growing. So it's not like we didn't expect different populations of bugs, but we're going down that road. Can we identify some of these things that are going on? Um, and then thinking, well, why is it different now in 2010 than it was in 2006? And what changes, and maybe you have a few more to add to this list, but I think sometimes we had, in 2009 anyhow, we had higher solids content, maybe because it was a cooler summer, so there's less sprinklers going on, so we had a higher solids content in the manure. Now once again, I said that there was a barn that had foam and they start off with two feet of water in their pit, and they still ended up with foam, so it's not totally just a solids content issue. 
have we reduced antibiotic use? You know, if you put a bunch of antibiotics in the pit, you're going to kill the bacteria. You're not going to have that problem. If we have been training our population of bugs in the manure pit based on antibiotic use, and then you change something with antibiotic use, might that change some of the population in the pit? It's possible. Um, we've been feeding DDGs heavier in the last couple years. Would that make a difference? Or those things that are related to, if you feed DDGs, and I'm not an animal scientist or nutritionist, but once you add DDGs to the diet, you have to change a few other things in that diet also to balance everything out. Is it something that we're changing, the fat in that diet or something else that might make those differences in the pit that we didn't have before? People said, what about corn genetics? We have GMO corn where we didn't have it before. Somebody said even that our corn is being bred for ethanol plants and it produces a different kind of starch or something that's more, more um, functional in ethanol plants and we're feeding that to animals and maybe does that change something? And we haven't looked at that. I don't know. It's a hypothesis that people have had. Um, we had a year or two of moldy lightweight corn coming in and we've been feeding that. Could that be part of the issue? And this might be some of the regional nature of the problem, too. Is there more moldy corn coming in one place than another? These are all just theories that things that have changed in the last couple of years that may be contributing to our problem. Um, change in type or quantity of fat being fed. Right. All, D all DDGs are not created equal, and they're doing stuff, some different things with the plants. And it, sometimes it seems like there's a, um, a geographic location. They're all feeding from one DDG plant. Now when I go to study that further, well it doesn't explain why one barn gets it and the other one doesn't. They're getting the same load of feed from that. Also, I talked to some guys and they said, well the feed truck goes out and we have several plants um, doing this, feed supplying, so we can't really tell if it's coming from one plant. Could it be one bad load that gets put out into the system and these guys get foam and... It's got a couple more here. Um, the future research, so yeah, better assessment of the hazards and risks with foaming. So we do need to look at um, possible cures and then look at this, what is the microbial population? What is going on that's causing this? So if we say, you know what, it's because of X ingredient in the feed, then we could say we should not feed that anymore. If we can prove that through some of this research. So we're going to look at the microbial population and we're going to say, these microbes really like these conditions. And we're going to say, how do we change these conditions in our barns? One of the things I'm thinking about right now is recommending, you know, new barns that go up, maybe we shouldn't have deep pits. There's a lot of hazards with deep pits beyond foaming and methane and explosions. We have pigs dying, and we have people dying in these pits with the agitation. There's a lot of risk. The air quality in the barns is not as good because we've got manure storage below the barn, and those gases are coming up into the, into the environment of the pigs and the workers. So maybe we should do something like that. That's not going to be the focus of our research, but I'm thinking in general, maybe these deep pits, we did that for a long time, maybe, we've, maybe we should learn something and say the next barns that go up should be different. Um, so we want to then look at some cures. So how can we, if you have foam, which is what I'm going to go into next, those who have foam, have you found a solution to the foaming problem? Have you tried some stuff? Yeah? No, no solutions yet. Right. And that's typically the case I get. Now sometimes the, sometimes the products work, and I will give credit to all the people who are trying to do products and do some testing of their products on these barns, because there is some evidence that this is a microbial process, and you have enzymes or bacterial additives, and you can change this process. That would be a great thing, to be able to change this process. I think sometimes these bacteria that are taking over the barn are pretty stubborn and they're hard to get rid of. That's why I think sometimes the products work in some cases and not in others. This is where I think we have to work at. We may not be able to predict foam formation, but we can reduce the potential for injury or damage related to the foam. So at this time, this is all we have. So if I have foam, what do I do? So sprinkling or soaking, typically the foam grows a lot faster when there's no pigs in the barn. That's because the foam isn't being broken up by the, the feces and urine going through the slats. So you take the pigs out of the barn and the foam takes off. Is that true? That seemed to be the case in most cases. All right. All right. We have some anti-foam products. So some products that you can put in that's, that it's used in industry all the time. It's used in chemical sprayers. Anti-foam products that you put in so you get rid of that foam. The possibility, it's like a soap surfactant that, to, to, to lessen that surface tension so you don't get the foam bubble formation. 
So we've tried some anti-foam. There's anti-foam products up there. Once again, some good success some of the time. Sometimes it doesn't work. All right, and I can't figure out why it works sometimes and why it doesn't, nor can the people who are using the products. Microbial enhancement, like I said, feed additives, manure additives, sometimes it looks like maybe there's a feed additive people are using because they don't seem to be having the problem that other people are having. That's why maybe some of these grower groups don't have a problem is because their feed contains something that the other ones don't. Is there something to that? Maybe there is. We haven't seen it yet, um, but I think there's some potential for some additives and some um, manure additives and feed additives to work. Microbial control, if we can shift the pH, if we can change um, um, maybe some antibiotics, and I don't want to advertise antibiotics for foam control, but if we could figure out a way to kill the microbial population in the pit legally, right, then I think maybe we'd have to look at that. How can we, how can we reduce that population and inhibit some of that microbial growth? So one of, the, one of the ways if you add oxygen to that pit, a lot of those bugs may not survive as well as oxygen. So if we can think of doing that, now the other issue is well, we got to have something we can afford to. So I think there's, a, there's an issue that, well, maybe we'll just live with the foam because it's really too expensive to try and eliminate the foam. But these are the things that we have right now to try and reduce that foam. It's not a great list, and I, there's no silver bullets to it. People have tried all these things, and sometimes they work and sometimes they haven't. Um, I do think that, that we have to track if we have foam or not, and because experience says that it comes up really quick. So I think... Knowing that you have foam means that you have to be out there in those barns checking for foam formation. It doesn't always happen the same in the whole barn. So I think probing that barn, looking for areas in the barn that might have foam formation, sometimes it's one end of the barn, sometimes one side of the barn, that this foam will start and then it will creep across the barn. So I think there's some evidence to say that we should be watching, do some sort of audits, weekly or monthly for sure, that you know that your pit is foaming or not. And then if you have some foaming issues, now you're going to do something different with your ventilation system, especially if you're doing a little agitation or thinking that you're going to be breaking that foam up. Uh, I think make sure that everyone working in the barns knows the dangers of breaking the foam. If you break that foam, you're releasing the methane, you have a high potential for an explosion when that methane concentration hits the heaters or some motor kicks on, whatever. So if you're breaking foam, you're you're spraying the barn down between groups. You're breaking a lot of foam. The guys that had the farm, the barn explosion when I first, um, when I first, that first slide that I had, they said there's a definite smell difference in that barn that they were breaking the foam. They could smell something else besides meth methane doesn't smell, but they could smell something different in that foam as it was being broken. Um, turn off ignition sources when you are doing that, breaking of the foam, and provide adequate ventilation. And I've been saying provide adequate ventilation to people for a long time. And then it's like, well, how much ventilation does that mean? Somebody called and said, well, what do you mean, like, adequate ventilation? Like, is that like one pit fan? I don't know. Two pit fans? you got to put on all your wall fans? It's really cold. That takes a lot of heat. Right? I'm going to turn on all my wall fans. What is adequate ventilation? So I did a quick calculation looking at um, the foam depth. So if you have a foot of foam in your barn, and you say, I want to reduce that ventilation, I want to ventilate to get down to 2% methane. This is below that explosive. Remember, explosive is between 5 and 20. And you start off with 70% methane in the foam, right? And you have a foot of foam with 70% methane. And you break that foam. How much ventilation do you need to get rid of that so it gets below 2%? Roughly, if you're running 100 CFM per pig, that's all your fans, you're down here in a couple minutes, right? If you are running... 5 CFM, that's one pit fan in a 1,200 head barn. So you're going below minimum. Minimum ventilation is at 10 CFM, probably two pit fans in a 1,200 head barn. So you're looking at, if you're doing just that one fan, 5 CFM per minute, and you only have one feet of foam, that's 51 minutes or 52 minutes of ventilating. If you broke all that foam, it'd take 50 minutes of ventilating with that one little fan. That's if you got good mixing throughout that barn. So you're not going to get... I mean, one pit fan running is not going to save you from having those high concentrations of, of um, methane in the barn. Turn on a couple fit, pit fans, that's 25 minutes with minimum ventilation. That's if you got good mixing. So you break the foam, run the fans for 20, 25 minutes, you're going to end up with hopefully, 
in that lower than explosive concentration. Now, if you got more foam, four feet of foam, now you're talking over 100 minutes at minimum ventilation, those two fans are in there. So it's a significant issue. You've got to ventilate. Yes, it's going to get cold in the barn. All right? But I think the ventilation is really important. That's what saved us so far. It saved us last fall from, I think, several explosions because it was warm enough that people could pump out and still have all their ventilation going. In general, agitation and pumping keep pe people out of the building. You know, ignition sources turned off, um, gas supply turned off. This is one that came out of the Iowa group. They said, you know, we should be turning off the gas supply. If there's going to be an explosion and you have your propane tank hooked to your to your barn, well, there's another big supply of fuel that could cause a problem. Ventilate properly. And we just talked about the ventilate properly, um, making sure there's a lot of ventilation fans. This is just in general when you're, when you're pumping. Um, mixing fans, if available, because there's pockets in the barn. If you don't get good mixing in the barn, that will cause um, high concentrations. Somebody said in Iowa, they said, you know, I really like this foaming bacteria. He said, because we don't have to agitate anymore. He said, if we can control it, where we didn't have this hazard, he said, it works out really good. Because in general, when you look at a foaming pit barn, there's a lot of microbial activity. And I think, I don't know, you can verify this with me, but I think that there isn't much need for agitation if you have a lot of this microbial activity. In the barn. That's something to verify yourself. But if we don't need to agitate, that would be a really good thing. And then we don't have to worry about these high gas concentrations. Um, for sure, and somebody said the other day, they're saying wait till it's halfway down before you agitate and pump, right? Before you turn on your agitators, pump for a while till it's halfway down. I say two feet, they said halfway down, but then you have to worry about well, are you going to get all your solids out? Well, if you don't have solids in your barn because of all the, the bacterial activity, well, maybe it's okay to wait till you're that far before you agitate. When you agitate, there's a spike that goes up with hydrogen sulfide and methane. You see it all the time. A large spike. You'll go to a thousand uh, ppm often, which is enough to kill you. One breath will kill you. That's why the hogs die, is because you get this big spike of hydrogen sulfide. Now we have the additional problem of methane. Um, the other thing you can do is agitate intermittently. So if if you're if you agitate and then stop agitation, let that barn clear out a little bit, and then agitate again. So some intermittent agitation can help you keep that concentration of methane or hydrogen sulfide lower in the barn. And no rooster tailing. Obviously that rooster tailing means that if you get the agitator running in your barn and you're starting to splash over the manure surface, you're going to see a spike of, of hydrogen sulfide and methane concentrations up in the barn if you're doing that. So 